Hey everybody, welcome. I'm Justin K. Hughes, Licensed Professional Counselor, and I am so thrilled that you are here tonight joining me, or at a later point once we have uh, recorded. We are covering exposure and response prevention for OCD, uh, the history of it, the treatments, uh, all the basics, and so much more as well. What a joy this is to do this presentation in the first place. Uh, a little bit more about me here. Uh, first of all, so I'm the owner of Dallas Counseling PLLC, located in Dallas. This is my studio, aka my office, where the magic happens. Um, and uh, ultimately, I'm a part of several associations uh, and contribute time, spend time with advocacy. I love writing, creating content that is relevant and helpful. Uh, for sufferers uh, of OCD, anxiety, and uh, similar conditions. Uh, so again, just really excited to be here tonight. Uh, we have some learning object objectives. Uh, what we're going to cover is uh, four key things. Being able to differentiate intrusive thoughts in the average population and then in those with OCD. Also to define OCD diagnostically. Uh, and describe really the history of its treatment, which has been a little bit bumpy. We're hopefully going to grasp and reiterate the most effective treatments, and not hopefully, we are going to, uh, and then understand exposure and response prevention in action. Now, this actually will be facilitated much more smoothly if you have the downloaded copy. Go to my website now, justinkhughes.com slash OCD, you can download this all for free. There's a ton of links to free resources, articles, all sorts of things. And uh, through the presentation, all you have to do is click on that. It's uh, very easy to find. Okay, so a few disclaimers that are really, really key. This is not therapy. And I really mean that. That's not just a CYA policy. Uh, there is a difference between therapy and education. Uh, we can give good ideas and tools, but as we talk, as we go along here tonight, we're going to discover uh, many of those differences. Um, also, there's some mature content here, so just be aware uh, this is for uh, an adult population, even though uh, we'll cover topics around children and adolescents with OCD. Uh, no financial conflict of interest. If you navigate to my website, you'll find different affiliate links for purchasing books or things like that. But uh, all of the stuff I'm covering tonight is free. There's absolutely no obligation to purchase, become a client. Uh, I'm a passionate advocate here to help those who suffer. And then last of all, uh, we do have a question and answer time. If you look at the top, you can see the link to go to. Uh, we've already gotten a couple of questions so far. And you can just ask your question throughout whenever it's open. And uh, we'll take them throughout. And you can just check anonymous if you want to remain that way. Okay, you ready to jump in? I'm excited. Let's do this. All right, you, me, and OCD. So, first of all, let's take a look at thoughts. Let's consider intrusive thoughts. Uh, so, by and large, as clinicians, we think we all have them. When we look at studies and reports uh, of intrusive thoughts, there's a lot of folks, uh, or some, some folks think, oh, people, there are people who don't have intrusive thoughts. By and large, it just really seems like everybody has them, but by the research, it says 90%. So uh, a huge majority of people will identify with having various thoughts. These are some key examples. Maybe a thought of jumping off a bridge onto a highway below. Maybe it just it crosses your mind. It's like, oh, hmm, what was that thought about? Thought of contracting a disease somehow. Obviously, right now, we get uh, an extra impact with uh, the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, but it can be any number of different diseases or illnesses. Have you ever had just an impulse to just do something, jump, do something uh, that would seem violent or, or strange uh, that you didn't know where it came from? Maybe it seemed out of place. You're like, why did I have that thought? These are examples of common intrusive thoughts that come up for folks. Uh, maybe the thought of killing or hurting somebody, a loved one, even that you have a close relationship with, even if you enjoy that relationship. Leaving a door open or unlocked, uh, opening yourself up to potential harm. And a doubt of whether or not you abused a child. And we're talking about intrusive thoughts here. 
maybe a sexual impulse thought or urge contrary to your values or typical experiences. All of these examples are intrusive thoughts that come up. Um, and in the normative population, they occur. But there's a difference. If you have OCD, or if you know somebody who has OCD, these intrusions will also come up, but there's three really key differences that we can look at. So they're more distressing, they're resisted more strongly, and they're more repetitive. So take any of those examples and many, many more that I just mentioned, such as, uh, let's say, uh, the, the impulse to do something violent. If a person has a passing thought, uh, let's say even if you're driving in traffic and it's just a passing thought, what, what would happen if I ran my car off the road? And in assessments, if we look at that person and we say, oh, well, not depressed, I don't have a history of suicide, anything like that, it's a little bit easier to pinpoint that and say, okay, no, it's just an intrusive thought. But in OCD, imagine being plagued with this type of thought. Imagine just that pressure and that weight of what does this mean? Do I have to address this or not? Uh, huge significant difference right there so now wait a second don't don't we need to do something like uh, tell the police call 911 report it uh, call a medical practitioner well in short fashion what we want to do is what's called a functional assessment and i'm going to talk about this a lot more uh, here in this presentation uh, functional assessments or analysis for those who are more behaviorally minded uh, will look at the interrelation between different parts, thoughts, feelings, sensations, behaviors. Uh, in its most simple form, you have the context or trigger, uh, the thought about the uh, feeling or sensation, and then the action in response. So for example, if I have a passing thought, like uh, what if I ran my car off the road and I'm scared of that, I'm startled. Whoa, why did that come up? I look at it and I don't have a history of trying to commit suicide. It's not something on my radar. It's a little bit easier to call that an intrusive thought. Um, but oftentimes we have to do some really, really solid assessment and rule out for what we call comorbidities, things that co-occur, uh, other problems. Uh, but OCD, uh, we'll get into the diagnosis of it in a moment, has some very specific diagnostic features. This is where a professional can really help with this but some people feel pretty confident in the diagnosis itself. All right, so first of all, let's talk about a history. Uh, and actually, something I'm gonna go ahead and do is open up uh, a little bit of the Q&A here. Um, take a look at some of the questions that we have. Um, so bear with me. <laughs> oh, I'm getting used to live streaming. All right, so out of some of the questions we have, um, when did ERP begin? Okay, great. I'm about ready to get into that right now. By the way, just a reminder, if you're just joining for the first time, uh, make sure to go to slides.app.goo.gl, whatever that is up there, and then you can actually interact with me live. Uh, these questions uh, are from a couple of folks. When did ERP begin? We'll get that. Um, well, not a clinical diagnosis. <laughs> so Freud and the rat man is the first it might not be what you think uh, so there was a man a very prominent uh, attorney in fact who had some obsessions about his father and who would become his wife about them potentially suffering a terrible torture method i won't get into the details here you can actually look it up in the notes but the start of it was Freud actually nailed the diagnosis. He called it obsessional neurosis. We, that's, we have a different term. It's kind of a pejorative term now, but uh, he was able to pinpoint that, whoa, this man gets stuck on certain thoughts and he has very specific behaviors that he has to do. Uh, so the first case study that we know of was Freud and the rat man. But the problem is psychoanalytic and psychodynamic then and also now uh, do not provide the framework to effectively treat OCD as a whole. Now, uh, Freud claimed that he uh, cured this case. Who knows? Uh, biographers have looked back and said that his case notes were actually quite a bit different than what was written uh, in the write-up. Uh, but even if, if he did, case-by-case -case instances, we're going to talk about personalization here. Now, everybody's a little bit different, but case-by-case, -case, it, it wasn't effective as a therapy. So 
we have to remember too that psychodynamic and psychoanalytic practice has dominated a chunk of the 20th century. And so uh, even once uh, observations and research in science was starting to uh, catch the fact that, oh, there are these behavioral and cognitive uh, issues that clients are running into, uh, the dominant framework just really didn't provide a space uh, to effectively treat uh, OCD and its symptoms. So we jumped into behavioral psychology uh, in especially the 50s and 60s, and really we can go back and give a lot of credit to Joseph Wolpe uh, in the 50s and 60s, Vic Meyer in the 60s, uh, and then it was uh, Rapoport and Foa, Judith Rapoport and Edna Foa, and Kozak as well, uh, in the 80s that were getting into the full steam success of exposure and response prevention. But the thing is, that's from a clinical standpoint. When they're doing clinical trials and research, it takes a little while before it actually trickles down further. Okay, so checking on questions here. Uh, answered that one. We'll follow up with another question here on scrupulosity and treatments at a later point. Uh, so great. Let's jump into the basics. What is OCD? Okay, so very simple. Mental health disorder characterized in three parts. So you have intrusive, unwanted, obsessive thoughts, urges, impulses, and they're clearly distressing. They create problems uh, and uh, a person can't easily resist them or just shake them off, basically, get over it, right? Uh, second of all, there's going to be those compulsions. Uh, so the responses to probably one of the greatest misnomers in OCD treatment and possibly in the support of those with OCD is that there has to be something overt, that it has to be a physical compulsion. No, we're going to learn how distraction can be a compulsion avoidance, mental rituals, counting, thinking through things, prayer, any, anything basically can be a compulsion. Uh, and then of course disruption. It has to be a substantial significance disruption. Okay, so who has it and how prevalent is it? Uh, so there's a number of estimates ranging from one to three percent. It appears that the best uh, deepest dive in the research uh, best estimates are one to two percent. So for those of you clients or followers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas, um, that's going to be about the entire size of a suburb like Richardson. That's actually where I live. Richardson, Texas, uh, about 130, 140,000 people in the DFW area. So in the U.S., roughly 6.6 .6 million if we're calculating 2%. And then worldwide, 156 million people. So sometimes in uh, research, 1% sounds like it's rare. I've been to doctors before who have said, oh, 1%, it's pretty rare. Well, when we actually boil it down, that means uh, a school of 500 people will have five to 10 students, or a church of 1,000 people, of course, is going to have 10 to 20. Uh, so it really starts to stack up. And we're going to get into disability, but it disability is so significant that we have to pay attention to this not just for the sufferers but from the standpoint of advocacy get into that more uh, also it's pretty equally balanced across socioeconomic status culture gender religious and other differences um, so it's kind of an equal opportunity uh, employer uh, or disorder uh, Onset is most common, although it can vary a lot. I've seen that in my practice. It's, it's most common to be puberty and early adulthood. So we see a lot of changes in the brain at those two times of life. But I've had clients who, from their history, by and large, we can't really find significant patterns of OCD prior to age 35, 40. Maybe there's examples later. And of course, there's examples much younger too, but these are gonna be the most common. All right, so subtypes. How is this actually experienced? Um, also, one of the ways that OCD is overlooked is to think that it's just contamination and just checking, just making sure my hands are clean, making sure I'm checking for locks. And though that's a part of it, it's just one tiny, tiny, tiny part. Um, so when we look at obsessions, different researchers, just for the sake of studying, will try to categorize them into four or five different domains. So 
we might argue that we could break it down into four domains, but I'm not going to spend too much time arguing over whether it's four or whatever. There's so many different manifestations. So contamination, doubt, just right obsessions, harm, and uh, unacceptable thoughts. And as a subset of these, though, too, it, many times they cross over, but un unacceptable thoughts can be sexually intrusive thoughts. It can be uh, thoughts of, uh, am I gay or straight? It can be thoughts of uh, health concerns, but then those things can cross over to harm, uh, et cetera. Um, compulsions, uh, really, really extensive. I mentioned that even distraction can be a compulsion. Obviously, washing and cleaning, checking, repeating, reassurance, ordering, et cetera. Uh, but distraction has to be functionally assessed. For example, if I look at this uh, moment where I am triggered by a contamination concern, I'm later going to use an example of I see a Band-Aid. Uh, let's see, I see that Band-Aid on the street, and I wonder, um, is it bloody? Does it have some sort of pathogen? Is there some sort of... Uh, illness that could be passed to me. Uh, well, that's a pretty obvious presentation of OCD and folks are used to things like washing, of course, afterwards. But for example, if I can't bring myself to look at it and I hum a tune that I like, uh, listen to a podcast, distract myself, that distraction functionally serves as avoidance in that moment. And that's something that we're going to have to tackle. All right, so just to leave this up here, couple of charts on the occurrence of obsessional themes. I wish the research were a little bit newer on this. You can see 92 and 95, two different studies. Um, I think we'd have more examples um, and be even a little bit tighter with the research on this if we did it today. But as you can see, it's very, very common for contamination. I mean, it's, it's the most common contamination obsessions, but doubt, pathologic doubt follows a close second somatic concerns, bodily concerns. And then for compulsions, uh, the frequency of those compulsive behaviors, uh, as you can see here, checking very off, uh, actually the most common, um, but then cleaning and washing, second most common. Uh, there's a lot of other ones too. So to treat OCD effectively, we have to catch all of the different little manifestations. Now that's not that we have to be perfectionistic or anxious or fear-based, but we just want to be thorough. That's key. Okay, etiology. Eat a what? <laughs> this is causation. What is the cause? And as with many things in this life, we don't always have a chance to say this exactly is the cause. There's one reason. There can't be any other reason. Uh, genetics, about 27 to 65% heritability of OCD. Wow, that's a huge range. 27 to 65. That's pretty crazy. Um, well, so it's higher if the onset is in childhood. Uh, so if I recall correctly, uh, about 40 to 65 percent of the heritability can be genetic if uh, the symptoms manifest themselves in childhood. Uh, neurobiological abnormalities are seen. Um, correlation does not equal causation. Just because we see it doesn't mean that there's a direct cause with that. And we're still researching all sorts of things. I mean, we have some great research. Uh, Susan Suido leading, uh, leading the charge with pandas and pans. Uh, so for example, an infection like strep throat in childhood, great evidence base, and we see some unique ways that sufferers do suffer who are diagnosed pandas or pans. It, it's a real thing, and also it's still being researched to say, but what is it? Is it its own thing? Uh, what exactly is going on there? Uh, traumatic brain injury. There are some cases and instances where uh, TBI led immediately to uh, symptoms of OCD, uh, where a person didn't have the diagnosis prior. Um, so that's a question. Pregnancy appears to uh, affect onset for some. Chicken or the egg, did the person uh, have OCD? Was that a trigger to uh, epigenetics is the field of study that looks at how our genetics are activated. Could it be a stressor? Uh, and then stress in general, which is kind of connected to every potential disorder. All right, course and disability. So here's, here's the thing. When we're talking about maybe one to 2% of the population, uh, for those of you that 
maybe know somebody, um, but uh, don't suffer with OCD, don't know of how drastic uh, it can impact a life. World Health Organization with medical and mental health conditions. So we're talking about everything from cancer to heart disease to diabetes to loss of eyesight to uh, mental health conditions of PTSD, depression, anxiety disorders. World Health Organization consistently rates OCD in the top 10 of contributing to disability on the face of this planet, a top 10. So it's rated as sixth with anxiety disorders as a whole. So if you lump it in all together, uh, anxiety disorders and OCD, they contribute to the sixth largest cause of non-fatal health loss. This is wild. And one time OCD was uh, separated and it was given a top 10 place. This is unreal. Two out of three individuals experience severe impairment. So that means a uh, leave of work or a person can't function uh, at home or relationally uh, or any number of different manifestations. So pretty big deal. We're going to get into treatment here in just a second. Let me go ahead and check in with our Q&A. Um, yeah, this is going to be good. I'll uh, present this question so you can see it. Struggled with scrupulosity, was recently challenged by my therapist to go back and reimagine Jesus being with me, believing that I had committed the most horrible sin and now know that I, sh I didn't. Uh, should it be this painful, sad anger filled is reliving those moments a necessary part. All right, so we're going to follow up with that here in a moment once I explain a few other things, and this makes a little bit more sense. Again, please uh, ask away any questions that you have. Really, really grateful uh, for those who've submitted theirs already. Okay. So there are really two treatments of choice, two first line treatments and one of them is considered the gold standard uh, the largest effect uh, typically the greatest benefit when a person can tolerate it uh, so cbt cbt specifically with exposure and response prevention uh, that's really key cbt specifically with exposure and response prevention second of all sris you might scratch your head and say, I thought it's SSRIs, Justin? Well, yes, uh, except there is one tricyclic antidepressant known as clomipramine that has a lot of research behind it. It's actually probably the most studied medication um, and is beneficial for OCD. It's just a little bit older. Some people report a few more side effects. Um, so by and large, it's SSRIs. So uh, think of name brands like uh, Zoloft, Luvox, Prozac, Lexapro, uh, those are SSRI medications. Okay, so talking about exposure and response prevention, the efficacy is really high. This number still shocks psychiatrists when I train at clinics. Uh, it still shocks, uh, I think, the average person that I share this with, that 80% of participating patients respond well to a trial. In the research, a 60 to 70% average symptom reduction. What? 60 to 70%? That deserves Keanu Reeves. Whoa. I mean, that's pretty significant. What in the world are we talking about here with that? Uh, 60 to 70% is moving from uh, the severe impairments potentially of being locked up in rituals hours per day to maybe it's down to minutes or at times in some cases being blocked from going into work to being able to. Now, it's not always that large of a leap with what's called a trial, which is generally 16 to 20 exposure sessions. Um, but 60 to 70% total symptom improvement with one trial on average. Uh, one of the reasons that I love this work is that that's just, that's pretty cool. And it really attracted me like I, um, for good or for bad, I'm a person who likes results and though we can never guarantee that and it's a little bit different for each person to know that there is such a powerful and effective treatment that can do this for most, that's huge. We need to pay attention to that. So to be clear, uh, this is not what's called cognitive therapy without behavioral experiments. This is going to be an important point that's touched on uh, here today. 
Um, I've got nothing against cognitive therapy, and it's actually very, very effective as a treatment. It's, it's still a first-line treatment for OCD, but exposure and response prevention is the gold standard. There's a reason there's the most number of randomized controlled trials supporting uh, its use, supporting its efficacy. There's some good randomized controlled trials and head-to-head -head with ERP and cognitive therapy. But what's really, really key is that cognitive therapy, uh, a lot of sufferers will say that they went to a person who said they were CBT or cognitive, but there were no behavioral experiments. There was thought stopping, there was replacing negative thoughts, and by and large that doesn't work, and we'll get into that more. Um, but cognitive therapy for OCD is a very specific uh, protocol, very, very specific. So either way, we're dealing with some specific protocols, and the behavioral experiments, no, they're not exactly the same as exposures, but at some point there are behaviors that a person will have to try and to test. The behavioral component is what ultimately changed the landscape. So let's go back to the history of it, right? That the effectiveness of the treatment didn't really enter in until we had some people who were brave enough and bold enough to insert the behavioral strategies with thought processes and cognitions and really make this into a science and an art as well. Uh, Edna Foa, who's in many regards considered the, the mother of exposure therapy, she said exposure-based treatments have the largest evidence base to support their use for OCD. Pretty simple. <laughs> Nothing wrong with vitamin D. I encourage it with a lot of clients. So let's look at the gap between evidence and practice. If the evidence is so strong that we're supposed to be using exposure and response prevention as a gold standard, all right, what's the deal? Well, 26% in a research study of advanced level clinicians reported that they seldom or never used exposure for OCD. Exposure is very useful for uh, any anxiety disorder, certainly phobias, um, but it's, it's used in generalized anxiety disorder. It can actually be used in depression. Uh, its focus is a little bit different. Uh, but these PhD <laughs> clinicians, so the top of the top uh, in training, seldom or never used exposure. And then 80% of patients, uh, more research, never receive exposure when indicated. So 80% of the time when exposure is indicated, it would be at least useful, if not necessary, to help a person. Ah, oh, I'm so passionate about this. It just boggles my mind. But I know some of the reasons why it's not used. And so let's debunk a lot of the myths here. Well, also I wanna point out that children rarely receive exposure therapy. When you look at me here today, I do hope that you'll see that my office isn't just a scary, terrible, awful place, and that I'm not just some scary, awful, terrible person. I guess you wouldn't know necessarily, but many people have these misnomers in their mind that it's harm uh, inducing or there's going to be a problem. Well, let's look at that. Um, not only are clients sometimes afraid, but therapists are also afraid. There was a, a research study as well, actually the same one that looked at um, the advanced level clinicians not using ERP for OCD and it found it, it polled clinicians and what they found was that the actual words that clinicians trained clinicians were using as far as their perspectives on exposure therapy the following insensitive rigid ineffective potentially iatrogenic fancy word saying to cause harm not real world, unethical. Wow. How can we expect exposure and response prevention to really get out there, get people the benefit of this gold standard treatment for OCD and also first line treatment for all other anxiety disorders uh, and also PTSD, by the way, um, if we have those perspectives in the clinicians, clinicians who've spent uh, six years beyond college, eight years beyond college, rotation is studying these things. Man, I am passionate. So it seems like this, beware of the dog. 
And sometimes it kind of turns out like this. Not to say that exposure isn't sometimes scary, of course, in the moments, but <laughs> let's, let's look at how it actually works. We'll get there. So the gap um, in the research, we find that finance and insurance coverage is a big deal. It's a real thing. It's a real issue. The accessibility, something I'm always thinking through as well. Access to, um, I have talked with individuals all throughout the country and even worldwide. And depending on where a person is, it could be a rural community or even some states. Uh, if you live in Alaska, uh, it's going to be very hard to find, uh, at least locally, uh, a provider. Now, fortunately, virtual work many times actually works very well, and there's research on that as well. Uh, there's also a lack of trained professionals. Uh, can only guess as to all the reasons, but um, there is a lack of training there. The stigma, already talked about that, and just lack of awareness of the research. Well, I have a few personal thoughts, if you'll indulge me. So just from spending years in this realm and talking to the experts, I uh, want to add a few personal thoughts that will hold as hypotheses at this point. Or at this point. Uh, exposure and response prevention is still kind of new-ish. You might think, what, 40 years? That's not new. But for me, in my lifetime, for that to be a brand new in the history of humankind, <laughs> In the past 40 years, it is kind of a blip on the radar, and a lot has to change to get uh, new ways of thinking uh, and to change a landscape, to change a system, which, by the way, uh, today is the 18th Happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day, while we're talking about changing systems and landscapes. So with ERP, it's still newish, and I think that that comes to bear on it a little bit. Also. CBT and psychodynamic are still the most common orientations in practice as a whole, but even CBT can be weighted to be very cognitive behavioral, or excuse me, cognitive therapy heavy without the behavioral experiments, without the advanced training in this. Um, so that can look like, oh, so you are concerned about this band-aid. Uh, well, on a bad day, it would look like well, okay, well, just tell yourself the truth about this. What, what is this? That's a new band-aid. You just saw me, okay, and tell yourself the truth. Well, it doesn't work so much when we're working with what's called the doubting disease. Um, well, go ahead and just replace that thought. Replace it with a positive thought. Uh, that starts to engage with the obsession and uh, to run from it to instead of to be able to sit with it. Sit with it is a, a common thing that we'll say. Uh, there's a lot more that I can say about that, but there's uh, limited time here, of course. Uh, and also, too, from a psychodynamic standpoint, and even trauma-informed treatment, uh, which is wonderful. Um, so much wonderful work is being done today in research as to trauma and the treatment of it. Uh, but by and large, um, most, uh, most professionals are still highly influenced by thoughts, theories, beliefs that there are underlying issues to problems. So if you say something like, oh my goodness, I feel like I could kill someone, the first thought even for clinicians, if some are being honest, not all, but some are being honest, it would be, oh, well, what's really going on behind the scenes? Have you seen some violence? Did you come across something? Was there something in your childhood? Um, and the root problems, but also trauma, probably most commonly, that's uh, a lot of clinicians, whether rightly or wrongly believe that trauma is almost the start to everything. And by and large, when we do the research with OCD, trauma can have a connection. It can exacerbate certain symptoms, be a comorbid uh, issue, but it's not causal um, so far as we know. And all the treatments that are working off of a theory that doesn't have a connection to trauma are, well, more effective than any other treatment addressing trauma. So just to, trying to be clear, hammer this home. And the exhibit A is me with this. That at one time, uh, I was not aware of how OCD was treated, but I certainly liked the clients that I got early on in a clinic until I started to purchase books and talk to others and want to get trained more after the fact. So I do have that personal heart for saying, oh, I didn't know once I had my degree in licensure at, at the first, but then I was able to learn. And I hope to do that for other people. So misnomers of exposure. Yep, a lot of people. I don't know if you've seen this meme before, 
this little girl, <laughs> cute little girl, but scary little eyes. Uh, so a lot of times people think that exposure therapy is just doing something crazy wild. Um, no, it's not that. Okay, so SRI treatments, covering the stats real quick, it's often beneficial. Uh, 40 to 60% of patients get about a 20 to 40% symptom reduction. Uh, not as much as exposure, but still pretty good um, in the medical treatment realm. Um, so important to look at. And then two, we'll look at what's called adjunctive medications and refractory treatments. So if a person tries those first line treatments, if you go to a doctor and they start telling you random things about treating an illness that is pretty straightforward to treat, it's worth asking some questions and digging deeper into that. But if you have an illness that you've treated with a first line treatment and you haven't responded to that, then okay, let's look at other options. So use of antipsychotics, Abilify, Risperdal, probably two most common um, to really, really uh, help. Sometimes it can be mood related. Sometimes it can be if a person's having a difficult time getting over um, obsessions or what we call overvalued ideation. Like maybe I really, really believe this Band-Aid has to be dirty, um, even though I just got it out of a pack and it must be okay. You can't tell me otherwise. Well, uh, sometimes the uh, mood stabilizer medications can really help with that. Um, TMS, um, some new research, it's newer on the research, uh, but can also be uh, one of those uh, treatments if other things have not worked, uh, but it is a specific type of TMS. Uh, gamma knife brain surgery as well, DBS. Uh, these are all treatments when a person is considered, and sometimes this has a negative connotation, but refractory. So if you try to do something and aren't successful, it's called treatment refractory. Okay, well, let's get into the meat of how we actually do exposure, ERP in action. I'm going to take a moment too and look at questions that we've got here. Okay, so yeah, uh, we'll go back to uh, this question here. Feel free to take a moment to check it out. So it's a great question. Um, scrupulosity, by the way, if we're categorizing obsessions in those four categories, uh, would be part of the, um, uh, the thoughts, uh, having thoughts that are disturbing um, and it fits into a category we'll oftentimes look at religious or scrupulous obsessions so um, in the just rights uh, or perfectionism obsessions uh, when we do a functional assessment we discover that oh the person is stuck on something because they have an obsession about um, uh, getting it right or feeling right um, feeling right is probably a, a better way to put it with scrupulosity it's more about am i doing right from a spiritual standpoint or personal value or in this case uh, religious beliefs um and so with with this i think it's a great example uh, it's always tricky when i can't actually have a little bit of back and forth conversationally and the first thing i'm going to go back to this is not therapy so i'm never going to say oh just cast aside this you have to talk to your therapist about this they may have reasons that they're doing certain things but let me speak just more directly to the research in this um so if visualization is very common in treatment of ptsd and with trauma it's great. It's wonderful. Positive visualization is a really cool thing. But one of the keys is if OCD has latched onto anything, it must be addressed successfully before there's going to be a relief from that. Uh, as clinicians, we have to make a differentiate or we have to decide what is the first priority. And sometimes that's a little bit tricky. Um, it could be uh, in depression, if a person doesn't have enough motivation, we're not going to be very successful in doing exposures if they're not motivated to do it. So we might deal with that first. Sometimes there's a reason to deal with really difficult, painful emotions first. But um, part of the trick here is that uh, if there's any compulsions with uh, any of these thoughts or from childhood, um, it's going to make it feel so much worse and it's going to feed it because compulsions drive obsessional anxiety and so we have to successfully identify what is compulsive because a person's going to feel worse in the end even though it provides that momentary relief uh, so we have 
the intrusion, there's anxiety, compulsion to make it feel better, and person gets relief in this circle, this cycle, but then the compulsion drives because we, we tend to, we think the, the theory is that we then learn that we need to fear this thing in the first place. Um, so uh, the reality is too, it's not just about going, I like to say beast mode through something, but it's successfully identifying what do I need to face without compulsing on a hierarchy. And if there's um, too much intersection between OCD and something maybe trauma or emotional, that has to be separated out through functional assessment. So great, great question. Um, talk to your therapist about that. Okay, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. SpongeBob style. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Most people, including my wife, find SpongeBob incredibly annoying, but I do love me some SpongeBob. <laughs> okay, so 10 steps that I put together here. These are 10 key steps that I use in the exposure therapy process. Um, there's really only a couple that are added on uh, that aren't always necessarily used in the research, but assessment, essential <laughs> in the research, tracking and monitoring, roadmap planning, hierarchy, um, exposure practice, et cetera. Uh, there's a, a bunch of these things that, no matter where you go, exposure and response prevention, will always have to have a few of these components. Um, actually, on hierarchy, not necessarily exactly a hierarchy, but you do have to have a roadmap, a general plan of where you're going. Okay. So let's go ahead and get into this. First and foremost, with assessment. We're going to want to understand uh, what the problem is, what a person's goals are, presenting problem. Um, I learned from the best uh, and from experts that spending, oh, it's like the construction term, measure twice, cut once. So I used to try to rush into giving people tools years ago. Um, because I saw the distress and I thought that they uh, needed that quickly. But what I've discovered is that if we have a solid foundation to stand upon, we know what we're doing, we're going to be way more effective. It's going to save a lot more time in the future. And it's less likely to have as many surprises in the process. So let's say it's just OCD and it's um, the singular diagnosis of OCD. And know this, that about 90% of sufferers of OCD have another disorder too. That's really hard, like anxiety or depression, trichotillomania, uh, tick disorder, autism, ADHD, uh, a lot of different things. So when sitting down with a person, some um, have the unfortunate luck, I guess we could say, of having five or four. And the assessment needs to be more detailed with that. So I'm going to spend at least two sessions doing assessment. Um, we want to get educated on it, to understand it. It is a therapy that in, has a high involvement of the individual. They have to do the homework. And so to understand that, to get that buy-in is really important. And then relationally too, um, we need to build that trust in the relationship uh, therapeutically. Um, if, if we look askance at the therapy provider, we, we don't think uh, they're going to walk with us in a way that supports us. Well, that's going to be difficult. And sometimes that takes a little bit more. So with children and teens, uh, it takes more time, typically building that trust, sometimes even the assessment. It's a little bit slower process in general. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, sometimes might be playing those games uh, to develop that trust so that the person doesn't have these monstrous images of some exposure therapist who's just going to do whatever, have them hold knives or, uh, or I mean, people think... Uh, all sorts of things about exposure therapy that like that fire example I've got to go set a building on fire I gotta go out in public without pants on or something it's like no like probably not <laughs> um, but we're going to assess it and look at it in your context uh, so getting educated is key and then considering comorbidities we have to make a prioritization call again if something else comes first, then we have to treat that first. If somebody is actually suicidal, then we have to treat that first. But if they just have suicidal intrusions and that's driving the distress, then we're definitely going to treat the OCD first. So uh, common assessments, if you go, and, and I want to encourage you, if you have the opportunity to go to a specialist in ERP, do it. It makes such a difference. Uh, you want to be looking for 
uh, this provider to be asking for a few things. Like we all tend to use a few different things, and I have uh, and know folks that I respect who will use one or the other or not all of them. But at some point, you're going to see a trend that assessments like well, self-monitoring, uh, tracking your obsessions and compulsions, of course, would be important. Uh, Ybox and Cybox, gold standard for rating severity. Uh, different checklists on subtypes are often helpful. Or looking at cognitive distor excuse me, cognitive distortions, um, and then some of the functional assessment work is huge. By and large, your therapist is likely doing that um, if well, if they know how to treat OCD uh, and are exposure minded. Um, but many, including myself, would teach clients to do that very specifically. It's a pretty cool tool. Uh, you'll get that here in a second. It's a free resource. Uh, using the FAS, Family Accommodation Schedule, DOCS, Dimensional, Obsessive Compulsive uh, Scale, uh, etc. So these are some of the things you want to look for. The functional assessment. Here we go. So it's looking at the interrelation, asking different questions about this trigger, the thought about it, what do I do in response to it, what are the results. Uh, and also maybe how, how I feel about that. Um, so from a purely behavioral standpoint, it's going to focus in much more on behaviors. From a purely cognitive standpoint, much more on thoughts and beliefs. But the beauty about CBT is it can involve all those things. And even what we call third wave psychology, third wave CBT particularly, will start to incorporate other things of uh, feeling sensations, mindfulness, uh, beliefs, uh, spiritual beliefs, uh, etc., and so it can be a really rich, deep dive into a really big picture and understanding how all these things connect with each other. If I could get a functional assessment, that'd be great. All right, so we also want to make the separation between ego syntonic and ego dystonic. What is that? Well, in shorthand, Ego syntonic is similar to what I want. Ego dystonic is different uh, from what I want. In, in big picture, it's not in the moment, but it's looking at a person's history, their long-term behaviors and actions. And sometimes it's just tricky to separate that out. So we're not going to do a perfect job, but we're going to, uh, at least as a clinician, uh, end up with an educated uh, uh, clinical judgments on that. And then clients too. Uh, distinguishing between intrusions and desires and sometimes you get a little bit of both uh, trigger alert <laughs> for uh, those with OCD that's a common obsession is do I really want to do this did I actually want to do this oh my goodness is it ego syntonic dystonic so if you get stuck with that well uh, hopefully you've got some good treatment to support you in that but it's important to uh, not give that obsession credit if it is one. Uh, oh, by the way uh, you can go to my website for a video explaining the differences between ego syntonic and dystonic. One other thing too about assessment is this core fear conceptualization. Uh, so, oh, sorry. So core fear conceptualization is not looking at a psychodynamic or subconscious or spending years trying to understand the connection. It's really looking at what we know. We might dig a little bit deeper, but by and large, what is it that drives a fear? So if I say that my fear is that um, somehow if I feel my heart racing and my chest tight, that maybe I could have a heart attack. Is that really the core fear? Well, probably not because heart attacks in and of themselves aren't necessarily the bottom of the barrel as far as what people fear. People fear their life getting cut short from what they would like. People fear um, how it would leave their family in uh, desperation or shock others or any number of things. And so we'll oftentimes use what's called the downward arrow technique, uh, which is kind of like a two-year-old saying, why, <laughs> what, or three-year-old, <laughs> why, why, why? My daughter right now is in this stage. Why this? Why, 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 why? And if you ask it with uh, hopefully <laughs> not the, uh, the petulance of a child, but uh, the curiosity of a scientific observer, uh, you can ultimately get down a little bit deeper and say, oh, well, when my chest is tight, I think I'm going to have a heart attack. So what? Well, I fear that I'm going to leave my family in bad shape. And I, so this is going to be really significant because oftentimes the compulsions then center around that. 
does a person then start Googling, Googling life insurance as their compulsion? Or is the person hypervigilant with their symptoms or they're seeking the doctor's opinion or going to WebMD or whatever else? Many times the core fear attacking that will help us to be more spot on with the treatment. Okay, so second of all, we want to be able to track and monitor well. Uh, early on, we want to develop a relationship personally with tracking and monitoring. So uh, not quite the same as journaling. It's a specific type of journaling. Uh, the OCD log, there's a link there. Uh, just as a reminder, you can download this on my website, totally free, justinkhughes.com slash OCD. Uh, you have the hyperlinks there. You can just click on it straight on the document. You get all these resources and documents free, many of which I'm using in therapy every single day with clients. So the log is just a place to put down the obsessions, the compulsions, maybe add on the level of distress, amount of time spent uh, compulsing. Uh, personalizing this relationship is huge. I tell clients you're going to want to develop ways to monitor your OCD. So personalize it in a way that's going to be real for you. So maybe that's in your phone, maybe that's on a piece of paper, maybe it changes throughout the course of therapy or uh, or your life, but get good at catching what's going well, what's not. Um, and then also the functional assessment can be another tool. We have to learn to catch compulsions and rituals in all the subtle ways that we can give in to them. Looking away quickly as opposed to just glancing like you might normally glance if you didn't have fear driving it or disgust driving it. Um, all those things reinforce the fear, reinforce the disgust, reinforce the obsession. If, if we're compulsing, we've got to catch our compulsions. Sometimes they really are very subtle. So the roadmap planning is the third part. Now, the hierarchy was seemed and deemed as essential at one point. And sometimes I just throw it aside um, because A, I'm working with the child and they don't need to see all these scary tasks in front of them. I can just have the plan in my own mind and so I'm writing those down. Um, sometimes for clients, they need to connect with what are their actual goals and values? What do they want to be doing? Uh, but we still need to have a roadmap. Like where are we going with these things? Um, a little bit later, I will do a run through of all these 10 steps with a theme. Uh, so again, uh, feel free to throw on the question and answer uh, if you would like a run through of any one of these subtypes. So I've got a couple in my mind that I can do uh, or I can personalize uh, one of those themes for, for someone's request. So roadmap planning, we've got to, got to know what are we targeting, you know, what are rough amounts of time that we would expect basically to be targeting something when do we push? Um, but we don't have to spend tons and tons of time on this day, I'm gonna do this and this. So much can change day to day. Many times I'll walk into an exposure with a client, even if we know we're gonna go to this place or spot or drive in the car past a certain place or spot or fill in the blank, um, but we're not going to run ahead with rumination about those things. We're gonna have an idea of where we are and then what's that next step we can go uh, to? How can we push it? Uh, so, of course, fourth, interesting, right? The, the first three aren't even exposure because of that good assessment and good planning makes for good exposure. So highlighted here, systematically facing fearful or avoided stimuli while reducing fearful responses. It's basically all it is. I tell clients again and again and again, ERP is remarkably simple, but it's not easy. Um, so this is what we're doing. And <laughs> there's a differentiation between exposure therapy and exposure and response prevention, but by and large response prevention is for OCD because with some disorders, uh, phobias for example, the key safety behavior, in it's not called compulsion with a phobia, it'd be a safety behavior, but is generally avoidance. And so it's largely avoidance. I mean, there's other safety behaviors that people pursue that need to be addressed, but Ritual prevention comes in where you have so many little things. It can be internal in one's mind, physical. It can be posture change. It can be tapping. It can be counting. It so many different things. So we got to catch it all. Like Pokemon, got to catch it all. Catch them all. Um, we have to practice, practice, practice. 
So here's a form. This is uh, Jonathan Abramowitz, one of the foremost researchers with OCD. Uh, he put together this form. You can find it on his website. Uh, it's one of my go-tos still to this day. Uh, and you can also go down to the ERP uh, tips for OCD. Um, checking that out. Uh, I think you'll uh, hopefully find that beneficial. It's uh, largely based on Abramowitz's work as well. Okay. So, in action with exposure, it requires adjustments and edits. Uh, this is why you want to build a team of people who can understand, who are willing to read and research and study um, and seek out um, your best, have your best interests at heart. Um, it's hard work, very, very hard work. When we're talking about a disorder that can cause severe disability for two out of three people in one of the World Health Organization's top disabling disorders, medical or mental, then we need to give this attention. And mental health, I believe, is making the unseen seen in many regards. And so to stack a team around us to be successful is very, very powerful. Um, so adjustments and edits along the way, we may have to adjust how an exposure is done. We will have to adjust how exposures are done. Um, what was even thought as the core fear might change a little bit, or you might notice uh, a change in the top of your goals or top of the hierarchy, that's okay. And definitely in the moment, a lot of stuff can happen and does happen during exposures, but we're gonna work smarter, not harder. We wanna address those core fears. We wanna match the type of exposure to the content. I'll talk about that uh, here in a second. But a lot of times people think, oh, exposure's not working. More! Kylo Ren, love it, but not necessarily. So we have two sides. One, people who are afraid of exposure, but then on the other side, uh, there's this misnomer, and you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's probably a little true of the exposure therapist being a hammer to a nail. Well, when we're assessing this well, when we're walking with a person, uh, it's not always just more exposure if a person uh, needs to look at their willingness to do an exposure, or how if they have a theme like pedophile OCD, how they may feel a lot of shame, that they, they fear that they could be some sort of monster, terrible person, we might have to pause real quick and say, what are you telling yourself? How are you talking to yourself? We'll get into that here in a moment. Okay, so the cognitive work uh, specifically, uh, very, very key. Uh, the cognitive work is, again, it's a first-line treatment, but it's not the gold standard, uh, cognitive therapy specifically, but CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, we're going to look at how faulty beliefs contribute to compulsing, specifically in OCD. And sometimes this is more important with different subtypes. So I mentioned pedophile OCD, POCD, uh, relationship OCD, uh, different sexual intrusions as well. Uh, the research talks about some of the differences between uh, sexual and religious obsessions and oftentimes how more cognitive work has to be done. There are things like overvalued ideation where I think that, well, maybe on paper, I don't have to pray this prayer 10 times or maybe on paper, I didn't uh, just commit an affair, but what if, what if I had a passing thought like, Maybe I should do this. Does, does this mean that, um, that I'm wanting to, et cetera? We oftentimes have to do some more cognitive work to separate out, like what is truth from fact here? What is the person actually doing? What are they acting upon? Is it a fear? Is it an intrusion? Is it something that's wanted? Is there a history? Is there a connection? Or is there a, a ego syntonic, ego dystonic, both? And this happens with addictions. 25% of people with OCD also struggle with a substance use disorder. So they might also fear uh, harm-based, impulsive-based uh, decisions. So many clients with OCD will obsess on what if I'm an alcoholic or turn alcoholic. And even if they smell alcohol, if they're in a restaurant and somebody else orders a beer, they could just walk out, leave. Um, and they don't struggle with it at all. They may totally abstain. Um, that's the very ego dystonic presentation. But then sometimes you may have an alcoholic who also has OCD. And so we have to separate those things out. Um, 
and the cognitive work that can be a part of that. So ERP in action, uh, more, we want to look at additional tools. We've got a few more to go here and then I'm gonna run through some of the, the examples of how this might apply. The additional tools, um, those might be things like mindfulness, acceptance and commitment theory. Uh, you'll see that down here. So ACT, uh, ACT, motivational interviewing, DBT, et cetera. Um, these are some of those adjuncts that are used uh, treatment-wise, but mindfulness is not a first-line treatment for OCD, but I uh, haven't really found that a person can be very successful with ERP if they're not mindful. So if they're running ahead and ruminating, that's a compulsion. If they're um, thinking towards past events and instances, that's mental checking. That's also a compulsion. So learning mindfulness is, is oftentimes really, really key. And so that's why I actually put it as an essential. Um, doing a mindfulness-based therapy like ACT uh, and or DBT or where there's a lot of mindfulness incorporated, that might not be essential uh, for your success, but... And generally speaking, we're going to want to have uh, some strong mindfulness. Uh, there's an exposure-friendly mindfulness guide that I have totally for free. Uh, feel free to click on that link as well. Number eight, value developments. Very common is a subset of ACT, acceptance and commitment theory. Uh, it can be done extensively anyway. Uh, to some extent, values, we want to look at that in the first intake session. Like, what are your goals? Why do you want to get better? Why are you motivated to do this? Um, that's going to be an important reminder, keep us on track in different ways. Some people have a really good sense of this, and some people just really don't, and that's okay. So let's define it a little bit more. Let's look at what's your buy-in. So when it comes to those tough exposures and you're uh, sitting down on a floor that feels contaminated and you feel a level 10 out of 10 heart beating fast, like you're going to catch some illness by sitting down on a public floor, well, it's helpful at times if big picture wise, uh, you know why you're doing this because otherwise the most natural response in the world is just to bolt, to get out of there. Um, so the values uh, developments uh, I see is pretty key, although it may not necessarily be a part of every clinician's work. Problem solving. We want to expect most problems. Um, of course, anything can take us by surprise, but um, when you become expert, and, and not even talking about clinically expert, but if you're a sufferer or a family member, when you get expert at catching those things, being aware, you can start to anticipate problems. And so that's what we do when we have a good team around us, when we've done the tracking step one, step five, identifying the problem, getting educated, um, and then gaining support. Uh, we want to problem solve issues that come up. And, and that can also be all sorts of things like comorbidities, pandemic, lots and lots of things. Um, so one of the big differences between using a therapist and buying a book, for example, is help with a lot of these detours that are pretty common. 25% substance use disorders um, with OCD. 90% of the time there's at least one other uh, issue or topic that comes up. And sometimes they don't immediately interfere or interrupt. Um, a person can have ADHD and then just jump into OCD and not have to have a lot of focus, but I found a bunch of times with clients where ADHD itself uh, became an interrupter in at least uh, some sense where we needed to spend at least a uh, couple of sessions worth uh, of time addressing that and how it was affecting doing their exposures, etc. Relapse prevention, the last step. So we want to be looking at how it's going. What are we learning? This is a treatment that's based on uh, learning differently, acquiring different learning that rewrites and overwrites the old learning. So what did I learn? We want to be thinking about this. We want to plan for the long haul, anticipate struggles. This is a chronic and or episodic illness. Um, and so by and large, we don't think that people are cured of it as a whole. Of course, there may be passing instances. This happens in all of medicine where there is a rare situation where a person just gets over something. A disorder disappears, an illness disappears, and that's awesome, the miraculous. But for the day-to-day, -day, we don't plan on that. For the day-to-day, -day, we work with the plan that seems most reasonable in front of us. 
uh, and that's the 99.9% .9 of the time that it's chronic. Uh, that's my reference, not directly from the research, but by and large, we're going to look at it as a chronic disorder. So let's plan for the long haul. So when we get to the end of treatment, I want to be able to see a few things that you can design your own exposures and you can plan them for yourself. You don't need much therapist input, if, if any at that point, uh, that you don't have any disability uh, and that you just have more of a sense of, uh, of control uh, over, uh, over your life. So when we're starting to see these things, we can discontinue treatment. I average probably 16 to 20 sessions. Uh, the quickest I've seen the work done is three sessions, but then I have clients who stick with me uh, for the long haul with um, uh, added severity, sometimes added complexity. Uh, and by and large, my goal is to get you in and out quickly. And most of the time that can happen. Um, but sometimes uh, we have to take a little bit of a longer road with these things. Relapse prevention planning really helps. Uh, two resources, Shala Nicely wrote an excellent article on this. Uh, check out the link there. And then McLean OCD Institute, Institute um, in Houston uh, has an excellent handout there too. And our main goal is getting those compulsions to relative zero. It's not a perfectionistic game, but if we have any untreated areas of OCD, a person is way more likely to relapse. So we've got to address all these things and just remember that chronic and or episodic nature of OCD. <laughs> so a client sent me this a couple days ago. I'll let you read this. So, yes, reassurance. Um, <laughs> uh, as a clinician, and back to the family side of things, we have to sequentially take out what's called accommodation. A lot of reassurance. By the way, sexual and religious obsessions have a lot more reassurance seeking. That's one of those differences. So OCD is OCD is OCD, but also there's a lot of differences and variations. So no matter what we do, we have to cut out these compulsions. Uh, and find a treatment that's effective enough to do that. So that temporary relief of certainty, we want to learn to tolerate uncertainty, to sit with it, to feel those feelings and the discomfort, but then learn that we were able to handle it. And or that the worst case thing didn't come true, but exposure therapy at its best, systematically face uh, distressing stimuli without in decreasing over time, the, decre or the uh, fearful uh, or distressing uh, responses, reactions to that. So also one more resource, you can click on this uh, in the document, Common Pitfalls in ERP for OCD. It's another talk that I give. Uh, let me know in the comments if you would like to uh, have this as a live stream in the future and I can definitely do that. I'll look into that. Okay, so case example. Uh, let me two real quick, double check. Questions, questions, questions. Okay. All right, so we don't have any specific questions about a uh, case example that you would like to see tonight, and that's quite all right. Um, let me go ahead and turn the questions off right now so you get a little bit bigger uh, slide here. Well, now that I'm not even using the slides. <laughs> uh, so let's run through. All right, so a good exposure therapist is going to have various things um, that are at his or her disposal. Uh, a lot of ways that we can go with this, but let me go ahead and start with the Band-Aid here, uh, which I, I think I need it for uh, for my face. <laughs> this is what being a parent is like. I have gotten more injuries as a parent <laughs> than I did in all of my adulthood prior. This was getting whacked in the face by my three-year-old. Uh, so maybe I'll put this on and use it afterwards. Um, <laughs> so running through it. Let's, I'm going to go with a simple presentation of contamination and think of it hierarchically. So blood-based pathogens are very much a common concern. And if we look at one of the ways that this differs from culture to culture, it depends on what are the triggers. At one point, HIV and AIDS was much more of a concern uh, until there were more effective treatments, of course, for it and we understood it more. Um, and now a lot of the contamination things that I'll hear, sometimes just general, like I'll just get sick, maybe I'll get sick and die. Um, obviously uh, COVID-19, um, 
sexually transmitted diseases, uh, still big, still significant, um, sometimes being patient zero for some new illness. Um, so if we take just the, the fear of coming across blood uh, and let's, let's just take um, that I'm gonna get uh, HIV or AIDS uh, from coming across a Band-Aid. Very, very common presentation. What am I going to do if I feel uncomfortable? If I want relief, I'm terrified. I'm gonna avoid it. If I see a Band-Aid in public, if I see red spots, red dots, anything that looks red, uh, in fact, you know, just looking in my office here, you know, there's uh, pillows back here that are red. Even just colors of, of large items can be a trigger for various folks. And there can be a lot of reasons um, or a lot of different ways, different contexts that the, the issue arose. As far as the reasons, uh, again, it doesn't have to be any deeper than it's OCD. And OCD plays on doubt, plays on fear, plays on disgust. And so if, uh, if I have a concern about getting sick, dying, getting HIV, AIDS, dying, my family, uh, being so distraught, uh, loss, uh, sense of failure, whatever it is, um, then not only will I maybe avoid things like watching movies that feature blood, I might actually avoid entire careers and occupations, maybe uh, nursing, uh, maybe being a nurse practitioner, a doctor, uh, certainly a phlebotomist uh, who's uh, taking, uh, taking blood samples. Uh, it could be avoiding doctor's offices, period. Uh, sharps boxes, avoidance there, very, very common. And so in the assessment, I'm going to look at that and try to understand and send the person home with assessments and say, all right, what's coming up? What are your primary symptoms, sensations with this? Some people experience the tight chest. Some people shallow breathing. Some people... Um, feel pretty calm physically, except for just a general sense of, I need to avoid this and get away from it. So we're going to track it every which way. Um, and that assessment uh, that, that I do, of course, is going to be established diagnosis. If it's OCD, then OCD. Uh, and if there's any other comorbid conditions. And then once the client has come back and they've done tracking all the different ways that they see it come up in that week and getting the big picture understanding, then we're going to shift towards number three, the roadmap. Um, and if I'm using the hierarchy at that moment, which I mostly do, we may look at um, uh, being at the doctor's office and seeing a, a blood sample could be a number 10, uh, or holding a blood sample of someone else could be a number 10. We're not gonna start there. Uh, that is one of the most common misnomers of exposure therapy, is you just do it, just do it, stop it, stop it, just do it. Oh, that's not exposure therapy. It's the systematic confrontation of distressing stimuli. So we're going to start where a person can, where they're willing, where their buy-in is, uh, where, where their goals and skills can take them at that point, which basically is not very far most of the time when we start uh, because once people get into the office, they haven't had success. And not to say that people couldn't have success outside of therapy, I'm sure it has happened, I'm sure it does happen, but ultimately, by and large, uh, the treatment has to be powerful enough to face a very powerful disorder. Um, so exposure itself, after we've got that hierarchy um, with maybe holding a blood sample being a 10, well, uh, that is, um, uh, oh, and you know what? Maybe I skipped the slides or maybe it's coming up, but there's different types of exposure. We want to have the right type of exposure. We want to have either in vivo or situational exposure if we have to face something. We want imaginal exposure. I have a video on this on YouTube here now. You can check or, well, not right now. Please stay with me. <laughs> uh, or uh, click through on the presentation. You'll be able to see that. Uh, but we want to apply the right type of exposure. Uh, matching the exposure type to the content type is essential. So if in the end I'm afraid of actually going out and engaging with things, it would be a failure of therapy to only do imaginal exposure, which is with thoughts. But the first few hierarchy items might be an imaginal exposure. It might be watching a video featuring blood. It might be uh, touching a band-aid or taking that red marker, for example. Um, and there we go. 
marking a band-aid so it actually looks at a distance like there's blood and then you know higher up on that hierarchy could here we go we're just gonna go ahead and do this putting it on the face wow and over a cut could be even a higher hierarchy item all of these different things um so exposures doing it though walking with a therapist who gets it who understands who's cheering you on uh, I had a client who said, I'm like a personal trainer for the brain. I love that description. I was honored by that. That meant a lot. Um, and then support around these things. So rarely, let me get this off now. <laughs> Am I setting a bad example by taking this off? So rarely do we do these things in a vacuum by ourselves. Uh, sometimes the support around us actually is helping us facilitate, accommodating uh these compulsions like oh they see the suffering and it's not quite the same as enabling with like a, an addiction because a person sees the suffering they see that disability and it doesn't have as much of a direct cause it's not the alcoholic who says oh hey it can't be around beer and then the family is like well hey this is a celebration they're like cheering that person on that's different than accommodation usually in ocd i mean it can be that um but usually in ocd um it starts from the place of, I feel so bad for them. I want to help alleviate the suffering. Maybe this could work. Uh, so we have to address that. But we also want to get some of that support to help with exposures because a person's going to have to practice. By and large, if a person is beyond mild OCD, um, we're usually talking about minutes to hours per week of different exposures. And in the most severe cases, people may have to spend um, you know, a majority of their day engaging in things that have exposed them to things that are stressful now with correct support. That's why intensive treatment is an advanced option there. So the support, the cognitive work. Do I have any beliefs that, let's say if there was blood on a Band-Aid, and let's say for example this Band-Aid is 10 feet away, do I have any beliefs that somehow that blood could jump off of the Band-Aid and contaminate me? Now to those of you that don't suffer with OCD or that subtype, that may sound crazy or what? How in the world could that? But Let's go back to normative intrusive thoughts. We've probably all had some sort of a thought like that at different points, uh, such as hearing a person cough who's 100 feet away and you're outside, but you still jump, maybe during the pandemic, like, oh my goodness, like, uh, am, I, am I sick immediately? Um, you know, it, we want to have a normative response. It doesn't mean that you go running towards that person and embrace them uh, during a pandemic. Um, but at the same time, if you're 100 feet away, that person has coughed outside. There's no reasonable evidence at this point to say that uh, you would immediately be at risk with that. So um, being able to do the cognitive work could be pretty important. Uh, mindfulness, being able to sit with this instead of running ahead like, what does this mean? What happened? Oh my goodness, uh, is, is this going to be something bad? Uh, was it really blood? Was it somebody else? Okay, that's rumination. We're going to sit with it. We're going to learn to describe it. See kind of a red swirl it goes a little bit up and down i see the padding on the band-aid it's brown it's a stretchy material it's part of some of those additional tools values like why am i doing this <laughs> uh, and we're not going to talk about that every second of the exposure but that reminder like i want my life back i am tired of making every decision based on the emotion, those things can really help drive the willingness, which is essential. No exposure therapy happens if a person's not willing. Very essential. Um, so those values, um, problem solving. Um, so, you know, problem solving could be like, maybe it's not working. Uh, maybe you set it up and the person's like, this is gonna be a level five on the hierarchy. And then you do it and it's not really anything. Well, that's not per se a problem, but maybe we haven't addressed the core issue and we have to go back at that point to what that is or maybe the person feels so overwhelmed maybe it was overshooting the runway they didn't communicate uh, or if you don't communicate to your therapist how something's actually going or what comes up afterwards uh, we might have to problem solve that sometimes clients will fall off the radar um, because something that they thought that they could do at that point it changed for them they couldn't when they're in the moment and they just various reasons and some of which i probably don't 
I don't know all of those reasons because I'm not told, right? Um, and then the relapse prevention planning. So once you get to the top of the hierarchy, your life isn't interfered with from OCD. You can go anywhere, do anything that a person without OCD can do uh, within reason, uh, within reason and your personal limits as a person. Uh, let's make it strong. Uh, and let's make sure that you have a plan going forward. And what happens if you have a resurgence of symptoms? A lapse is different than a relapse. Uh, what do we do in all those instances? Okay, so we're coming up at the hour and 20 minute mark. I'm going to check real quick for any other questions. Let me give this just a moment. Um, while I get out a special item that I brought here from my kitchen. Exposure therapy, one of the reasons that exposure is less common uh, to sometimes is the finances and costs involved. Uh, there are additional costs. I keep different supplies in my office uh, in different ways. Or sometimes it's just extra trouble as well, extra time if a home visit uh, is needed. And insurance as well sometimes will cover, but many times won't cover uh, home visits or extra time, not getting paid for travel, stuff like that. So these are all part of the consideration of what affects things. Okay. So the item from the kitchen is um, a butcher knife here. And this, what does this look like to you? So the average person might think it looks like a knife, stainless steel, Cuisinart, grips on the handles. The average person might think, why in the world does he have a knife? in his therapy session. I don't normally have this knife unless if I need to have an exposure. And, uh, so <laughs> um, the average person might think, um, why did he jump to the idea of a knife? Does he suffer with OCD himself about this? Various thoughts are going to come up. Um, so I'm going to run through real quick a harm example in a little bit less detail than the contamination. But let's say that I have a fear of uh, impulses in a harmful way, unacceptable thoughts, that I have these thoughts that, that plague me. The non-sufferer of OCD doesn't get it because maybe they've had a thought of, oh my goodness, what if I took a knife and stabbed somebody? But a lot of people don't have that specific type of thought. And so they may come across the person with OCD and think, wow, that what? Like you, you must have a problem. Well, in OCD, it only has to be defined by OCD to have those thoughts. And so <laughs> if we rule out that there's nothing else and it's OCD, well, then we're going to look at um, what do we need to face? Uh, what things are being avoided? What things are not being addressed in the process of exposure or uh, in the process of a person's life before they've done exposure therapy? Uh, so assessing, of course, tracking, getting that roadmap, what are we doing? And hierarchically, holding a knife like this and holding it really, really close to like a wrist or something like that. Um, just to be clear, if you're tuning in now and you're not uh, aware of what this video is, we're talking about exposure therapy. Um, we're not doing anything else other than that. Um, but with uh, exposure therapy, a person, uh, we discover that the person has avoided knives to the exclusion of uh, their life of missing out, of not cooking, uh, of uh, avoiding foods and meals that they would love to enjoy, or if they're seated at a place in a restaurant where they actually see uh, sous chef cooking, or go to Benihana or whatever else, just avoidance of those things. Well, we want to get a person's life back. And it's not just that. If it were just one thing, probably not a big deal, but that's part of OCD is it causes this high level of disruption. So it's having the thought of knives. So that might be level one, two, three on the hierarchy, watching some videos, uh, various levels of integration with that. Um, and this could also tie in with the color red um, in different ways. It could be taking a clothing item and pouring tomato sauce on the clothing item. Um, it could be saying to oneself different scripts, like uh, if the fear is, the thought comes into a person's mind, uh, what if I wanted to reach out and grab that knife and stab my wife? Um, then they sit with it. What if I wanted to reach out and grab that, wife, uh, that knife and stab my wife? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. And we've got to learn those ways to do the exposure, not the compulsion with this, because that's a big trick that we 
uh, we're learning early on and throughout the exposure therapy process that it's a fine line sometimes, so we pay attention to those compulsions. Uh, cognitive work um, about beliefs. Um, do I believe that I, it, some deep level maybe I have to be some kind of a bad person to even have these types of intrusions? I'm going to have to address that. Uh, mindfulness work, of course, the additional work, values work, problem solving, relapse prevention. Uh, so many ways that uh, all these things work together. So ultimately, when you're doing exposure therapy, we want to be like Drake. We want to have that intrusive thought at first. And we're going to want to avoid it. But then ultimately over time, after ERP, we're going to get that swagger. I want you to get swagger. So what's your purpose? If you have OCD, or if you're a family member, what's your goal? What's your drive? But purpose is kind of a deeper question. What am I about? You want to get your life back, help get a family member's life back, do the thing that you've wanted. Um, let me uh, let you see the whole thing. And couldn't do. Or improve relationships, not be so overwhelmed. Or just fill in the blank. Whatever it is, let's look at that. For that motivation, that willingness, that buy-in. I hope you'll dig deep with this. And I hope it leads you to uh, make those hard choices that can be good choices as well. So if you're ready for more, tonight has been the intro and also deep dive intro into exposure and response prevention for OCD. There's a lot of good starting points. So uh, I, I treat folks in Texas and Pennsylvania uh, virtually and currently in person uh, mass on distance, a number of other protocols, but um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, there's there's a couple of options. Uh, so on my website, uh, you can click on make appointments, um, but I want you to know that there's lots more free education. I am first and foremost an advocate. Um, I hope I have the opportunity to be a support for you, but there's so many resources. Um, International OCD Foundation is probably the first place to start for those general educational resources. I have a lot of some of the best in my mind of their articles on my site, uh, all these free tools as well. But the IOCDF.org, it is just the best first place to go. Um, OCDTexas.org, uh, I'm, I'm a DFW advocate for OCD Texas. Uh, we do a lot of stuff, free events, a lot of them virtual, so now worldwide you can access these. You can access the videos that we had from our fall conference. And OCD Game Changers with Chrissy Hodges, uh, sufferer uh, who is an advocate, uh, incredible resources. Uh, these all are there for education, to help dispel myths, to help you kind of in some of the cognitive work, beliefs about uh, these different things. And I just want to thank you so much for joining. Uh, it just really means a lot. Um, I hope that you'll subscribe uh, to one of my newsletters. Most of you all are already subscribed. That's how you came about this. Um, feel free to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, of course, YouTube here. Um, go ahead and uh, click on the subscribe box to get updates as to new videos. Uh, as well. And tonight, to those of you, most of you who have been a part of my OCD list, you're going to receive the brand new guide, When and Why ERP Isn't Working. Um, so you can just click on that image. All right. So just a big thank you. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you for coming, being here. Uh, whether it's for yourself or another person who suffers, what an honor it is for me to walk with you and with those who are journeying this road. And I want to encourage you that there's hope, that the treatment of ERP is massively effective, but it is an extraordinarily rare day where even in the most complex of situations, a person who sticks with it uh, doesn't find hope. Um, hope is there. Keep going keep going you got this and i look forward to journeying with you further thanks so much i'm justin k hughes licensed professional counselor
feel free to check out the rest of the slides for more information, references, and uh, I am out. See ya.